So first I will give a little motivation in introduction. So please, uh, tell to me if the handwriting is too bad or too many too small. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so motivation, so we had uh, some talks this morning about the classical equation. So we will have a lot of things uh, uh, with that. And we will, we will study in particular the following uh, SD. Uh, so for all i in one m, with the n uh, in the year, uh, we look at the SD, dxy, dxi of t, equals to dbi of t minus theta over n, sum, j different from i, xit minus xjt over xit minus xit dt. Okay, so every particles are living uh, in the plane. Uh, basically, you have n Brownian motions on the plane, and they are interacting through a collabian force. Uh, this is really uh, highly linked with chemotaxis, where you have uh, bacteria that are uh, exploring their environments, uh, that are diffusing, but they are uh, attracting to each other because they emit uh, a chemo attractant. Uh, so here you have uh, the diffusion uh, uh, phenomenon, a brain motion that is visiting the total space. And you have uh, all particles that are interacting in the sense that every particle is uh, uh, attracted by the other particles. And you have an intensity, theta, uh, this is just a real parameter, which is uh, strictly positive. And that say that uh, the interaction is uh, strong or not that strong. <coughs> okay, so when you have this equation, uh, so the other thing I wanted to say is that this SD is really linked with the uh, classical PD that we saw this morning. Uh, but I don't want to go into details to explain why it's linked. Uh, and what is interesting with this equation? Uh, there are two studies that are interesting. The first time is that there you have a uh, competition between two phenomena. The first one is uh, diffusion, the other one is concentration. And you want to know who wins. Um, will you have a direct mass because the concentration is too strong, or will you have a diffusion and all your particles are just going away? Um, another stuff that makes the equation very interesting is that here you have a singular uh, a term in the equation, so this is not well posed. Um, so you have to ask you the question if it's well posed or not. Uh, so I will have like two questions. The first one uh, that will be not very interesting, but I just I put there because it's important. Uh, the question of the well posedness is this SD well posed? And the answer is no. And uh, we will speak about it. So we will do the question with no solution. But they will have some um, solution in some sense, and we we'll speak a bit about it. But let's imagine that we have a solution uh, of this equation. And the real question that we'll be interested in is uh, behavior of collisions. Okay, so this is an interesting question uh, according to the uh, competition between uh, diffusion and attraction, in the sense that. Uh, who is winning? Like, uh, are you brain motion too excited and so they never meet? Or uh, the attraction is too strong and so they will meet at the point? And if they meet, uh, in which way? Uh, will you have only collision between two particles? Or collision between a lot of particles? Only with some number in which order? So there is a lot of question that is not going on. And particularly, the kind of question that I want to, to solve here uh, this, this kind of question, for example, say, for the sake of simplicity, the case where you only have three particles. Uh, imagine you have three particles in the plane, you have three brain motions, they are moving, and they will collide to three collisions. Will you have a uh, collision between two particles before or not? And this, this question lies uh, the competition between diffusion and concentration, because if the concentration is too strong, they will have uh, three collisions before uh, having other collisions. But if the diffusion is too strong, when they are close, they are vibrating too much. So they will collide before. And uh, okay. So we want to solve this kind of question. To ask what is uh, the, the behavior of the, of the collision in this, uh, in this equation. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about motivations. Uh, sorry, one question. Yeah. Uh, do particles can overlap? 
Overlap? Yes, in your, in your model. Oh, yeah, 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 ah. yeah just that's position. Okay. So, yeah. And that's what I call a uh, collision. Okay. When they are the same band. So, you see that there is a point here. Because here it's one over uh, the distance of the particles. Mm -hmm. So, it's not clear that it's well defined. Mm -hmm. And you will visit this place because it's attractive. So, there is a problem. Thank you for the question. Okay, so before going in the, the, the core of the subject, we will speak about a tool that I will use a lot uh, in, this, uh, in this talk. It's squared vessel processes. Okay, so for some minutes we just forget the situation and just focus on another kind of process. Uh, what I call a squared vessel process is uh, a process that which is non-negative, such that uh, it satisfies an SD, which is the following, dz t equal to 2 square root of z t dwt plus delta t, where delta is just a real parameter, and uh, that is just a drawn in motion, of dimension 1, of course. <coughs> so what is this? Uh, this strange uh, process. In fact, it's kind of an easy one because if you take uh, uh, delta, which is an integer, uh, if you apply it to a formula, you find that it is only uh, the square norm of a Brownian motion where b is a n-dimensional Brownian motion. So if you apply the Eto formula, you take the dimension, dimension n, uh, you take the square norm, you find that. Okay. And uh, you say, okay, this equation is well closed even if you have not an integer here. So you say, I just put a delta here. That's an equation. And that's, uh, if you can define a, a, a brown motion with dimension delta, this can be his uh, square norm. So it's a generalization of the square norm for brown motion. Okay. And if you have this, uh, this intuition, you have the following property. Okay. Um, okay, we have three Ks. The first one, is the handwriting is great or yeah. okay, perfect. Uh, if delta is larger than two, so you have a branch motion with a dimension larger than two. So you never reach zero. So this process never vanishes. Uh, ZT is three keys versus zero uh, for all T uh, positive are more sure. Okay, so if you imagine uh, with the intuition I said that kind of clean intuitively, uh, if delta is strictly between 0 and 1, uh, for all t strictly positive, then this the t larger than t, so the delta, the t is equal to 0, I'm not sure. Uh, so it means that you are in the case, you, you feel that in the dimension 2, you never touch zero, but you are really close to that, so it's a critical uh, uh, dimension. Uh, so if you are a bit, oh, that's not zero one, uh, zero two, sorry. If you are a bit under uh, two, you will touch zero uh, uh, a bit like uh, like in zero two, you have one. In a dimension, dimension one is touching zero in infinity many. Okay. Um, Okay, and the last case is the following. Uh, if delta is negative, uh, there exists a t uh, positive such that for t larger than t, the t equals zero emotionally. Uh, the t is random, of course. Uh, this is kind of clear because if you take delta which is equal to zero, uh, you see that in this uh, SDE, of course, uh, zero is solution. Since zero is solution, once you touch zero, since you have a strong uniqueness, I, 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 I don't have the time to show that, but if you touch zero, you stay at zero. So you, you stick because you are uh, uh, non negative. And if the dimension is even stronger, you are even more uh, stick to zero. Okay. So this property is kind of intuitively, and that's all I wanted to say about square based on process. Okay, so now that that's clear, we can go back 
to the killer signal of the particle system. Um, another question. Yeah. Um, the raw dependence, so the dependence on the cable, let's say, is encoded in the data? Or? Oh, can you repeat this? Um, so in the color signal model, normally you have a coupled system of equations. One oh, yeah. For, one for the density and one for the chemical. That's and, really um, in your SDE, I was going to ask previously, where is the chemical density encoded in the theta? Or? That's a really good question. I uh, didn't speak about that. But okay. I, uh, to, in my case, that's a particular case mm -hmm. where I, I uh, admit that the chemical attractant um, is present infinitely uh, with an infinite scale. So mm -hmm. when, you see, when you see here, your point is attracted by another point. There is no another chemical attractant that is attracting my particle. So okay, yeah. so this is uh, okay. So particles are attracted to particles only, but not uh, there is no direction towards the chemical. Uh, if you prefer, uh, yeah, they are just attracted by the other particle. If you prefer, uh, you have you, you you speak about this equation, um, something like like that. You speak about this equation, right? Mm -hmm. And I just say that uh, here's a diffusion because if you look at the real biologic school stuff, at the time uh, that the chemotractor is spreading is uh, really faster than the particle. So yeah. I say that here you have a number uh, of uh, diffusion that is really small, mm -hmm. and you forget that. Yeah, but uh, I'm also talking about the interaction between the particles and the chemical because there is a term, I mean, in the color single model, there is, a, there is a term describing the diffusion of the particles, which is your Brownian motion there, and there is another term describing the movement uh, towards, uh, you know, as a yeah, yeah. interaction mm -hmm. with the concentration of the chemicals. So that's, uh, but what I understand is that you are considering diffusion and interaction between particles only. Um, I mean, you say that you are to unknown the density and C. Mm -hmm. And I say that here, uh, C uh, is the K and uh, star F. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I just have one unknown. And okay. okay. But thank you because it's really important. Okay. okay. Uh, so we go back to uh, the chemical stuff. Uh, so I will just uh, put some notations uh, for all x in R2 power n. Uh, which I will describe as the follow, x1, x2, etc., xn. Uh, you have to see that as configurations. You have like n points uh, in the plan. <coughs> they can overlap and, uh, and stuff. Uh, for all subsets of 1n, which you have to understand the particles that I take, uh, we set all k of x uh, first. Sk of x, which is equal to 100 kernel of like the uh, empirical mean, and Rk of x, which is the empirical bias. Okay, like the dispersion of your subset of particles. And uh, this is like a really, uh, natural uh, object that you want to set. Uh, because you want to know if you have collisions, so you want to know if this guy is touching zero or not. Because if you use the dispersion of a k particle is equal to zero, that's they are at the same place. Okay, and uh, finally, I will set for all k uh, a space which is just uh, the configuration uh, such that so I don't have to. So Rk of x is strictly positive for all k such so that this cardinal is larger than k. So I want uh, any k collisions, collision between k particles. If it's the case, if I take k, 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 k particles anywhere, they are not the same place. That's what, what it means. Okay, and after all, as I say, uh, we say uh, that there is a k collision uh, in uh, x in the configuration x if r k of x is equal to zero, of course, and little subtility and uh, for all i who are not in k. 
n k million r m of x is the k position. Just to avoid confusion, so when I say that there is a k collision, uh, when I say that there is a three collisions, that doesn't mean that uh, just three particles are the same place. That's really only three particles that are correct. Okay, and so now we want to, to know how the collisions are behaving. So we want to know uh, this guy how uh, how he is behaving. So we use the two formula and we calculate RK of C. And we use the two formula. Okay, so you just have to trust me because I will not prove it because it's really too heavy. But it's the equation is the follow. Plus this is the KVT. Plus an interaction there. Okay. Uh, so several remarks I have to do about this equation. Uh, the first one is uh, we recognize a better process. Plus a perturbation. Perturbation that I will firstly just neglect. But uh, you have to, to think that is it is a really bad guy. You can't neglect it uh, because if you see the equation here, uh, the interaction between uh, a subset and the other uh, will contain some one over uh, distance between particles. You know? So, for, this, for instance, if you have a key particle uh, here, uh, and if you have a particle in the uh, complementary of K uh, other where, if they are far away, the interaction is they don't interact that much, so you can neglect this term. But it can happen that a particle here can go here, and so this interaction term is really huge, so you can't neglect it. But we will deal with it later, and we we'll just uh, imagine that it's not there. So we have like a square descent process. Another uh, little comment, I said uh, before that we don't have the existence of our process. I mean, we have the existence thanks to uh, the digital form theory, but you don't have the right to apply the little formula. So this formula is true in the sense uh, that, I, that I have with the digital forms, but you have to uh, apply this theory to have this kind of formula. So here, what we are doing is purely intuitive. This, this works. Uh, in, at the intuitive level, but if you want to do real stuff, you have to, to look at the energy of the process. And, uh, okay. But I will not speak about that because it's too complicated for nothing. But uh, let's imagine that we can use the little formula. Okay, uh, but there is one good news is that this guy is computable. This is like an explicit uh, dimension only depending on theta n and the cardinal of, uh, of k. And so if you remember like the property we have on the Bayesian process, we have the clue, we have a key of how uh, the subset colliding or not. We just have to take the dimension and to compare it with zero or like two. If your dimension is higher than two, you will have no collision. Between zero and two, you will have collision, but reflective one. Uh, it means you are touching zero and you are going nowhere. And if you are of a dimension that's less than two, particles stick together forever. End of the system because you really have no chance to have this to be defined if particles stay uh, at the same place. Because this guy is equal to infinity every time. Every okay, so I just have to compute uh, the dimension of the vessel and I will see uh, which kind of uh, collision we have. Before writing that, let's have a little talk about that uh, to see the, what, what we, we expect, intuitively speaking. What we expect is to say, okay, you have two ground motions, uh, what is uh, the probability that just two, uh, two particles are going to collide? Um, since they are ground motions, they will be really close, arbitrarily, and we put a little bit of attraction, so they will hit. So you imagine that so you will have maybe uh, uh, collision between two particles. <coughs> okay, uh, between three particles. Maybe it's possible, but it's even harder because you need to have three particles at the same place. That's uh, for the same reason that uh, a brain motion of dimension 2 is recurrent and dimension 3 is transient. And if you want four particles to collide, it would be even harder, etc., etc., and so on and so on. 
so what we expect, so here we have zero, and so it's the uh, and here you have two. So what we expect, we expect that the, the more the dimension is high, the less you will have collisions. So you expect something that is uh, uh, increasing with uh, the number of particles you have involved in the collision. So what you expect is something like that. Yeah, you see, it's logical. Like the more you have particles involved in the collision, the more it's difficult to have collisions. The difficulty is linked with the, high, with the fact that with a high dimension, the brain doesn't touch them. What we have for real is not that at all. So for real, what's happening for real is the following. The dimension is a polynomial expression of the cardinal of K. So what does it mean? It means that uh, you will have a collision between two particles. And you will have no collision between three particles, no E4, no E5, etc., etc. But at a point, you will have T9 particles that will be together and collide. And after, you will have like a 50 particle that will come and it will co collide with the other. And after, you will have a last particle that will come. And uh, because here, if you see well, um, I will put some name. Here you see the first time you are going under a 2, and I call the, the name of the cardinal K2. Here K1, and here K0. First, we have a K2 collision between K2 particles, like 49 particles, uh, because the dimension is between 0 and 2. After, we have collision between 50 particles, because the dimension is again between 0 and 2. And at the end, we have 50. One particle that are going together and that will collide and will stick together forever at the end of the of the story. So it's kind of counterintuitive, you know? Yeah. Can you repeat how are K naught, K1, K2 defined in terms of this curve? Ah, uh, how they are defined? Yeah. Okay. Um, oh, I see. Sorry, I just want to know if, if the intersection of this curve with zero has anything to do with those quantities. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah? I mean, K2 is the first time you are under 2. Aha. Uh -huh. It's just that. Okay. K1 uh, is the number after. And K0 is the first time you are negative. Restricted that they are the integers. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the first integer such that uh, you have interesting stuff that are happening. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Oh my God. Okay, so mm -hmm. so this is really a crucial point. So if you have questions, don't hesitate. Just erase them. We oh. take a bit of time. <laughs> so yeah, uh, K2 is the first time it is below two. Yeah, exactly. And K0 is the first time you know it's zero K1 below 1? Our K1 is just uh, because, in general, uh, I will not prove it, but in general, you just have two uh, terms that are between 0 and 2, and after us thinking it's negative. So K1 is okay. just K2 plus 2, plus 1. Okay. It's just a number. So, so, okay. Okay. So, uh, so there's no, no link. We, in fact, you're right. It's the uh, first one that will be under one. But that's not really fine. Yeah. Really yeah. so okay. really yeah. that that's it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I will just. Uh, uh, set a proper. Uh, 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 sorry, we have yeah. another question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Go ahead. In the, in this part, uh, so in the plot that you did before, yeah, um, when you have a zero, yeah, that means that you have a purely Brownian motion. Uh, uh, what? Purely? Um, yes, uh, because if I go back to the SDE on yeah, top, yeah. Um, if the D is equal to zero, right? Yeah. Which is, uh, then I only have the Brownian motion. So that's what happens um, at this point, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. And I mean this. Uh, yeah, this is just mathematically 
in since you have zero as a solution of that, mm -hmm. if you touch zero, you stay at zero. Okay. So that's why I'm interested in because it's the first time you have a sticky collision. Okay, and you know, at that point, all particles stay together. Exactly oh. until the end. I, I mean, that's just interesting because there is no proof of that, but that's what we think about that. And this block of particles, they move as a Brownian motion, or how? They will, exactly. Uh, okay, okay, okay. They, they have a mass that will be the sum of the mass of the particle. Okay. I mean, that's stuff I, I'm working on. Okay, no, on no, no. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Uh, okay, so I just announced the theorem. Of uh, my supervisor and myself. Okay, uh, so let theta, which is larger than 2, this is uh, an important hypothesis, and we have n super to 3 theta. This is not really important what this is, but I have to say that. Uh, for all x in E2, if you remember well, E2 was uh, the set of configuration when you have no overlap. Have to have to the same place. Uh, we have uh, Px homotopy the following. Like I mean, the, um, the system starting at x with these uh, initial conditions. So particles are not colliding at this point. So, so I will write uh, six points. Uh, the first one is if you set zeta. This is equal to the lifetime of the process, uh, such that uh, xt is not in e k0 anymore. So uh, the first time you have a k0 particle in the same place, which is logical because it's the first time you will have a sticky collision, so we don't expect the process to be uh, to live uh, after that. It's a uh, finite almost surely, and uh, x zeta minus, which is defined as the limit when t goes to zeta of xt, exists. So you have continuity of the trajectory at the explosion, which means that you have a real uh, uh, sticky collision, so that are really uh, stick at this moment. Okay. Second point, so there exists k0 in 1m such that the so cardinal k0 is equal to k0. Uh, so I really have to set here that k0 is equal to an explicit stuff, the integral part of 2 over theta, and uh, k1 is equal to k0 minus 1, and k2 is equal to k1 minus 1. So just you have this one that's defined after this one. So there exists a subset uh, such that uh, this cardinal is equal to k0 and uh, there is a cardinal collision in zeta minus. So I just say what I told to you is that at the explosion, there is an explosion because uh, there is a particle in k0 that are together and it's uh, exactly the critical number. Okay, three is the following. Um, for all k in k0, such so that this cardinal is equal to k1, so just one less than k0. Um, for all t strictly less than this uh, there, there is uh, a k collision. Uh, during uh, t zeta. So you will have your collision and before your, your explosion like k0 that are at the same place, uh, you will have uh, infinitely many of collision of one particle less. So I would say that if you have uh, 10 particles, uh, if k0 is, uh, is equal to 10, you have a collision between 10 particles, you will have, uh, just before that, infinite k1 uh, collision. And of every subset uh, of size k1, every subset of k0. So if you have three particles that are colliding, you have infinitely collision between these two, these two, and these two. 
Okay, and after it's kind of the same uh, as that for L in K in K zero, such that the cardinal of L is equal to K two, and the cardinal of K is equal to K one. Uh, for all t instant of k collision and for all s less than t, uh, there is the uh, l collision uh, on st, the same before every k collision you will have infinity many of l collision, like one particle less. Okay, uh, five for all. Um, okay, for all k prime, uh, including in one n, but such that this cardinal uh, is in uh, three uh, k two minus one. So it means uh, forbidden collision because the dimension is higher than two. Uh, there is no. K twin collision on uh, zero uh, zeta. And finally, the last one. But everything is uh, on the. You have all the, intu the intuition here. Point six. For all ij in L in K zero, such that uh, the cardinal of L is equal to K2. For all t instant of L collision, for all s less than t, uh, there is a ij collision on s t. Okay, so the same result as the point. Uh, Three and four, which means that every time you have a collision with k particles, every pair of particles will collide. Okay. Excuse me. Can yeah. I just ask you a question. So you have up there the condition n is strictly larger than three theta. So yeah. that means that uh, for these results to hold, mm -hmm. the stronger is the interaction between the particles, so the more particles you will need uh, for this to apply. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. And you say he is weird because you have a bound on theta, right? That's what you want to say? Uh, yeah. Because the theta is the parameter that goes in front of the, the difference between the distance between the interacting particles, right? In the very first equation that you wrote. Yeah, that's the intensity of okay. the, uh, the interaction. And I mean, this is just a technical one. This is not essential. This is essential because you, you need a strong interaction to have a collision. Mm -hmm. And when, why we want that? Because uh, if you want to have uh, two, then three, the, you know this scenario, you need to have a large n just to see the phenomenon. So you just need to have enough place to define a k2, define a k1, define a k2. Ah, okay, it's just okay. that. Okay, it makes That's sense. That's not a okay. problem. Okay. okay, perfect. Thanks. But thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. So, real uh, interesting stuff is this guy. Okay. So don't hesitate to ask questions at this point because it's, uh, it's the most annoying thing that's a crucial point uh, of the talk. And now we try to prove and to give an idea of why all of this is true. Okay. So we start uh, the final part. Right. Just to let you think about that. Okay, so I will try essentially what I, I will focus on uh, are the point uh, three and four because the point two and the point six are kind of the same. Uh, and I will just uh, briefly explain why the point one uh, is important. It's true. So we give uh, a proof that, like, not frequently, 
uh, begin by the case one. Um, we will take again the, the formula of uh, RK. Uh, maybe I don't, I don't have it. Of Xt that we calculated uh, before. 2 square root of Rk of Xt dwt plus the dimension plus an interaction bar. Okay. Um, what is great with this equation is that if you take, for example, k to be equal to 1n, you don't have an interaction part anymore because you don't interact with the other thing that yourself. Uh, so with k is equal to 1n, you will have that uh, r over n is a true uh, d theta 1, d theta n n uh, square descent. Square descent process. See, this is a real R, and we have the explicit dimension, the explicit expression. This is uh, n minus 1, uh, 2 minus theta, so you can trust me like I will not compute that. Uh, you see that the dimension is negative if and only if uh, theta is less than two, is more than. Two. Okay, so negative. So that's why you have this condition, the arithmetic stuff. Uh, okay, so that's why we have a. Uh, because if you if you don't have uh, if you have this guy this is strictly positive also the notion is strictly positive so it's not interesting so that's why yeah, I'm in this condition uh, so we have a, a collision at least with all the particles maybe before uh, I will not deal uh, with the existence of the limits I mean that, that's not trivial but uh, I, I really want to speak about the other stuff that are more interesting to me. But uh, I will admit uh, uh, the existence of this guy. But intuitively, you, you understand that it exists. Like it's just uh, you see your particles that are colliding. The question is, uh, are they colliding for real? You feel that it's true. <laughs> I mean, it makes sense physically speaking. I think. Uh, no, I will be more interested. Uh, in the following. So I want to speak about uh, point three and four, which are the more intriguing. Okay, uh, so the question is the following. Uh, I will reduce myself in a special case. Uh, we restrict ourselves to um, a special case. Uh, where I take the parameter, you know, I, I can calculate the parameter explicitly with theta n. So I just take my parameter such that k0 is equal to n. Which means, imagine that you have a, if you have a collision, it's a collision with all the particles. You don't have to ask yourself where is the collision with which particles. It's just because of that that I go into special case. And after we see how we can treat all the cases with the special case. But okay. Let's imagine that uh, if there is a sticky collision, that's uh, an obligation that it's with every particle. That's what it means. So again, sorry, this means yeah. that they are all together at the same position and they stick together. Exactly. Okay. But if you have a minus one particular same place, there is with okay. the okay. stuff. Exactly. Okay. That's the only uh, way to have the, the end of the process. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, okay. So we are in this case. Uh, and so the question is, uh, do we have uh, 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 for example, one n minus one collision uh, before the 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 fat fatal one n collision? So we know that the process will end at the point, and the question is: um, uh, Will we see? Do we, is there this kind of collision before? Okay, so 
If you remember what we saw with the equation of uh, Rk that I have here, uh, this is difficult. If you, you want to apply this equation with k equal to 1k minus 1k, because you want to know if there is a collision between these particles. So you want to know if this guy is uh, going to zero, but the problem is that, okay, this is a vessel with a good dimension that is between zero and, and, uh, and two, so it will top zero, but there is this interaction down. And now we have to deal with it. We have to, to manage it. And uh, as I said before, it's difficult to manage this term because uh, if the particle, the other particle uh, is going next to one of my other particle, and it will happen because my result does it, uh, we have a problem. So I have to manage a problem that will happen infinitely many. Okay, so we... Sorry, can, can I just ask another question? Yeah. So, this is like considering the case in which theta is equal to 2. Is that correct? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That, that's logical because that's the less intense uh, of the intense case. Okay. So it's so sort of a weak point. interaction regime. Exactly. Okay. okay, exactly. Good point. So we are at the critical case, in fact. It's not the super critical, it's critical. Uh, okay, so before going in the... In the in the, in the battle, we have to understand a bit more our process because there are some stuff to understand about it. Um, what is pretty interesting about this process is that you can decompose it in many parts. We already did that. We know that, and we call it dt, which is equal to r1n of xt, is a dt tau nn uh, squared basic process. We showed it. We have to think that as the length of our process. I will develop it later. We have another stuff that, I, that we know, which is not impressive, but like we know it's like the mean of the particle, which is S1n of xt, the amplitudical mean of my process. Uh, of course, uh, this guy, this is a brown motion with an additive part. With, um, with a diffusion with a coefficient like 1 over root of n. Uh, this is clear because if you remember the, if you sum all the particles, you have one particle that's attracted by the, by the other, and the other is attracted by the other, but the force are compensating. So at the end, you just have the sum of the Brown motion. So it's just a Brown motion. Uh, another physical way of looking at it is you, when you do the, the very central of the system, it's as if you were isolating your system. And doing um, uh, and looking at the force that are applied to the system, but your system is not isolated. There is no force, so it's just a blown motion because the forces are internal in your system. Okay, this is not a proof, but this is a good uh, physical hint of what happened. Uh, okay, so and another stuff that is interesting is that m is independent. I mean, if you do a calculation, that's kind of clear because here. It's like uh, you know the sum of run and motion, and that's only dependent on b i minus b j. So if you do like your bracket stuff, one minus one is equal to zero. So this is mathematical stuff you just write. That's not too difficult to see. A physical way of looking at the stuff, uh, the way you collide doesn't depend of where you are. I mean, if you just translate your your problem is invariant as translation. So if you translate to other place, it doesn't affect the collision at all. So it's not shocking that it's independent. If you want to redo a proof, this guy is exactly equal to that, with one over n, of course. And this guy, uh, you can rewrite that, bi minus bj, with a constant, depending on n. And so there is only this guy that are here. Uh, and so if you do the bracket, it's zero. OK. But that's not sufficient to understand the process. And we need a crucial like, crucial points. Um, okay, I will do it like that. We define u t of t, which is equal to uh, i x i t minus m t over the square root of t. Kind of natural because I, I told you that we don't care about the mean because we don't care about translation, so I just put all the particles centered at zero. 
Okay, that's minus mp. And after I say, you know, because imagine you have three particles here, you want to see if there are two conjunct over three, but everything is too close. I just zoom the stuff. I zoom spatially what happens. And that's that. That's a TCL time of, uh, that's classical in the stuff we, we do. Uh, and if you look at this, uh, this stuff, it, you just apply the Ito formula. Once again, I don't have the right, but I do it anyway. Uh, and this guy, so I didn't put, didn't put a name, just a full vector of, uh, like util is a u1 until un, is equal to, uh, they will have a lot of technical stuff that I will explain it. dt plus b of ut dt dt minus 2 minus 3 dt. I will put that here. Okay, so it, it's uh, it sounds complicated, but uh, no worries, I will, I will explain. Uh, so many stuff to explain. The first one is, uh, so it is a brand motion of uh, before. Uh, B is defined as uh, you have uh, Xt, which is equal to Bt, with B of Xt dt. B is just the drift of uh, the chemical system. You know it's it's i minus j over the square. I just give a different name because I want it as a vector. So it's just a chaosable part uh, here. So this is uh, it's kind of clear. Over two. Yes. Check another one. Uh, here we have just the root of dt. Here we have dt. Here we have dt. Uh, age. Age. Is uh, the set of configuration such that the mean is equal to zero, and that's all. So, okay, it's kind of frightening equation, so we we'll just spend a little bit of time to explain. Um, here, uh, we have the Kela Segal. Uh, before, before doing that, just look at these guys. This is not an autonomous equation. But there is just this, if you erase these guys, uh, you, you will have an equation that only depends on you. So it's kind of uh, independent stuff, so we can think it's, uh, it's something you can uh, study by itself. But that's really great that we have this kind of stuff because it suggests to do a change of time. You see what I mean? So uh, change. Sorry, can, can you just ask another question? So, yeah, you said that you are not uh, in a regime in which you are allowed to use the ITO formula, yeah. but to use it. So, it's like uh, you write it down formally, and then a posteriori you justify the use of it. Exactly, exactly. Okay. I mean, and the way to uh, justify is just by using the derivative forms. Mm -hmm. And by uh, I don't use any formula, it's just I take the energy of the system that I decompose in three energy that are independent to the sense of the okay. And so, this is really true, oh, okay. yeah. if it exists. I mean, what we have shown is that, because our equation is not totally true, totally false, you know, there are a lot of points or moments when it, the equation is, uh, is true. Mm -hmm. The problem is only the, the, the moment of collisions. Yeah. So if you forget these points, this is true. Okay, okay. Because you have the right to use the formula if you set some stopping time. So that, okay, okay, thanks. Okay, another time to adjust to to the stuff. Huh? Okay. okay. So when I see the process I just wrote uh, here, I want to introduce a new process. Huh? Uh, where I change the time to make this appear as a and to, to have um, and to have an equation that is uh, only dependent that is uh, self-contained. Okay. So what I, I need to write is the following. Uh, Oops. We just take another one. I will set a of t 
which will be my change of time. I want to put this change of time to make this appear on like dt in my root of dt, and u of t, which is equal to n minus of t, and I set dt, which is equal to u field of rho t. I just change the time. And if I write the equation, that's the same, but I erase this dependence in dz. And so it's equal to. And after I can finally explain you the equation, to let me do that. Uh, plus b of x t dt minus z over 2 dt. Uh, so here we have an autonomous uh, equation. Uh, and here, and here, uh, they are just cosmetic parts of the equation. What it means is just you stay on the sphere. Because our process uh, uh, has the following uh, property the sum of u of t is equal to 1. Because I just subtract uh, m to every part. So if I sum over m, you have the mean minus the mean. And uh, the sum uh, of u1 uy t square is equal to, uh, not the other one, zero of course, and this is equal to one, because I normalized it by uh, the root of dt. Okay, so in a sense, I am uh, ut for all t is in s, which is equal to the sphere of h, centered at zero and at three plus one. So I am on the manifold. Okay. So this guy is just saying you stay on this, uh, this plane and you stay uh, on the sphere. And this is just a compensation because if you ask the Roman to stay on the sphere as it's vibrating, you, you need to have some compensation to really make him stay on the sphere. That's just a cost of okay. So the pi sub h and the pi sub ut, those are just terms you don't care about? I'll get that in the first one, can you repeat? Oh, sorry. So the pi sub h and the pi sub ut, what are those terms? Well, what is that? Yeah, the first few symbols. Oh, uh, just, ah, it's a, uh, orthogonal. How to say that? I mean, I project uh, on the, the orthogonal of ut. It's as if, oh. you see what I mean, it's just geometrical, you are on the sphere, and you want to project on the tangent space. Oh, those are two projection operators. Exactly. Wow. Oh, yeah, sorry, that's two projection, right? Okay, so I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> sorry yeah. uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's projection. You just stay. Uh, you stay, so you just take the tangent part to your sphere, and you uh, you want to, to stay in this space. Okay, H we have already defined, and U orthogonal with the tangent. Term. Okay. Okay, and here you have, uh, here is the dimension of the transformation. So you have 2 times n, which is the dimension of the system, and you, you suppress 3 degrees of dimension. Two here, because you have two dimensions, and one here. So I suppress three really degree of dimension, so that's why I have this term. Okay, and so I want to focus a bit on the... And there is something that's really great about this change of time. Uh, everything is okay with the equation? I was still a bit concerned. Okay, okay. Something that is a bit crazy is that A of zeta is equal to infinity on much time. Because that's a cell, it's a point where he vanishes, and you have to show it that it's not that, that hard, you can do it really easily. Uh, he's going in to zero a bit too slowly, in such a way that uh, the integral is diverging. So a of zeta is related to a of t there? Yeah, I mean, um, I apply a t equal okay. z. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what does it mean? It means that uh, this change of time send my zeta to the infinity. So it means that ut is defined on R plus. So I just, at the first time, you know, zoom spatially in space, and what happens is that it makes me zoom to time. So the more I, I, I approach the collision, the more my particles are freezing in a really natural way. And so what's really incredible in that is that uh, before I was asking, 
do I have uh, this kind of uh, identity? Do I have uh, n minus particles colliding before my n are colliding? This guy is. Uh, is it up? I didn't define that. It's just uh, do I have the n minus one collision before the n collision? And no. It began. For you, do I have the n minus one collision? Infinite time. And that's a far more. Um, that's a far more natural question to ask because here this topic time are really correlated. It's a huge mess. Here you have a process that's independent of the rest. You just ask if uh, he has uh, some n minus one collisions. Okay, so let's focus on the angle of the process because it's a, like uh, m is a mean, d is a radius, and use the angle in a, in a sense. Okay, so I just focus on you, and uh, so what I want to see is to see once again this guy. Yep, not this guy because this guy is equal, always equal to one. Is this guy? And I want to know if this process uh, vanishes at a point. Um, and if I do some calculations, uh, I find something like that. Uh, so for here, it's a very similar of the, the past stuff we had. So just here, you have an uh, additional uh, term with a bond in motion. Uh, you have the dimension and that's what you see. You have, of course, the interaction term. And you have some normalization term. Okay. Um, it's not surprising to have kind of the same stuff as before because here, if you look at the equation, this is chaos angle on the sphere. That's the same equation, but not some type on a diaphragm manifold. So you have the same kind of behavior. And uh, so you have kind of the same equation, the same interaction, uh, and some normalization term because you want to stay on the sphere. But this guy is uh, really negligible. Like, you can neglect it because it's not too heavy, it's just uh, cosmetic stuff. And uh, what happens is that uh, uh, when r 1 minus 1 of ut is uh, small, uh, this guy is approximately equal to 1, so I can say that's the same equation as before. So, in this case, when we have that, this guy disappears, and we have the same equation as before. The problem is that we still have the interaction term that's the same problem as, as before. But not really, because now uh, there is geometrical constraint. I explain myself. When we are in this case, uh, it means that uh, un, un, uh, un minus 1 are closed. Since they are closed, and since that and since the barycenter is equal to zero, ah, they are all near zero. Since uh, the sum of u i is equal to zero, u n u n minus one. This is not rigorously true, but that's almost all of that. If you want the mean to be equal to zero, you need the most of your time to be really small. And if this is the case. Uh, since the sum of the square norm is equal to 1 and the most of the term equals 0, it means that the norm of u1 square is equal to 1. This is the only term that counts. And so what does it mean? It means that on the board you have all your particles that are near 0 and one particle that is on the other side. So they are far away from each other. So they don't interact because you can um, make a bound on the interaction because they are far away. If they are far away, you can forget this guy. So we have a real square basic process. <coughs> the only problem now is that it happens only if uh, this process is already a bit small. 
It doesn't have to touch zero. If, it, if it's a bit small, you have a positive probability to touch zero. So the last argument now is to show that uh, really often we touch zero. Uh, we, we are close to zero. And I think we will end with that. Sorry, can, can I just ask you again? So yeah. The equation that you have at the very top uh, of the blackboard on the right, uh, where yeah. does that come from? It just means that. Um, you mean the whole equation in yeah. the angle? Where, uh, how do I calculate Yes, how did you get there? Uh, I mean, uh, you, this equation is a bit ugly, but you can have a more explicit uh, way of uh, okay. just uh, position on the uh, angle, you, you subtract the. Uh, uh, with, with scalar product, you can express that really uh, explicitly. Okay. And just you apply it into formula. Okay. And just into formula, really easy one, really, uh, really gross. <laughs> but it's just easy uh, formula. Uh, easy formula. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. So, I will just end with the last argument. It's really not the most complicated thing I will. And with that, so okay. And so we only have to prove uh, that R one n minus one of U T is often small. Because if it's the case, every time you have a positive probability of collision, and so by uh, oral cantilever arguments, you will do that infinitely many. But that's clear because UT, uh, since it has an equation, it's a Markov process. UT is a Markov process on S, which is compact. So what I say is not rigorous, but in a sense, it implies that UT is a positive reference. You have to work a bit to show that for real, but in a sense, UT is positive reference, so he will um, visit infinitely many, a little open set uh, close to zero, and every time you have a positive probability of collision, so you will do it infinitely many. Uh, because we will visit that uh, really often. Okay, so I will conclude uh, fastly because I'm out of time. Uh, just to situate you in the proof, what we prove is a special case. We prove the, the case where uh, uh, if you have a collision, uh, it's a collision with all the particles in this case. And you have to prove that it's true even if k0 is not equal to n. And uh, for, how, for that, you have a, a bit of additional work. And I will uh, enjoy to speak uh, about it uh, during the, the Super Thank you very much.